Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Lovely to see you, and uh, thank you for joining with us uh, this morning for uh, our time together as we seek to worship him uh, and glorify our God and consider his word together. We're going to make a little start, and we're going to sing our first hymn. Our opening hymn is number 38 in Songs of Victory, if you're using a hymn book, otherwise... Um, the words will be projected above my head here. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. And let's stand to sing this hymn through, please. pray this morning. Uh, We want to remember um, the strike uh, of Iran against um, Israel uh, last night. We want to remember those who have lost loved ones and those who are sick at this time as well. Uh, So let's bow together uh, and pray together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you Uh, for our hymn, this opening hymn, uh, this morning reminding us, encouraging us even uh, to praise him. And uh, Lord, uh, surely he is worthy, worthy to receive glory and honor and power and majesty and might and dominion. Uh, For who is like unto our God, Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, 
doing wonders. Indeed, uh, we have a wonderful Savior, a mighty Savior, one who is able to save, save, one who is able to keep, one who is able to provide for, one who guides us uh, throughout life, one who is uh, mindful of us, who cares for us, uh, one who ever lives even uh, to make intercession for us. And we come to you, Lord, this morning in his name, the name of Jesus. Uh, indeed, Lord, you have given him a name that is above every other name, at which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we come uh, to you in his name. And uh, Lord, we bring the situation there before you in Israel, Lord, today, and Lord, in the Middle East uh, in general. We think, Lord, of uh, all that has been happening there over the many months. And Lord, uh, there last night in particular, uh, Lord, there are many who are fearful of what the outcome of this may be, how this may escalate. And uh, Lord, it is not taking you by surprise. Uh, and Lord, you know the outcome. Nevertheless, we, we come to you and we pray again, uh, Lord, as we are reminded, and we're even reminded there yesterday, uh, that there is even an onus on us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And not just, Lord, uh, that holy city, but Lord, uh, we do pray for the, 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 the peace of the nation uh, and, Lord, the nations in that region. Uh, that, Lord, this would not escalate further. That whatever might be done, Lord, uh, that, it, that it might be done wisely and considerately. Uh, that, Lord, uh, there would be no, no uh, 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 great escalation that might draw other nations in, uh, Lord, to a war. Uh, even there, uh, Lord, in that whole region and uh, Lord, no doubt others would be fearful even uh, that, might, that might spark a, 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 a war the world around. And so, Father, we pray again that peace might come. Now, we know ultimately, Lord, that, that the peace that the nation needs there uh, is uh, for Christ himself to come. But while he tarries, we pray that uh, you might even uh, bring about a peace, Lord, a peaceful resolution uh, to everything that is happening there in Gaza with Iran and any other, uh, Lord, nation that might seek to rise up, uh, Lord, at this time. And so, Lord, we pray again for peace uh, to be brought there. We pray again for those who have lost loved ones. And Lord, we think especially again of Tom uh, and of Lucy here. Uh, and we pray that, Lord, in these days of bereavement, uh, Lord, that you would draw nigh and comfort. Uh, that, Lord, they might be conscious of your presence. Uh, we know that, Lord, uh, Margaret's home call will have left, uh, Lord, a, a, a great... Uh, Lord, the house will be quiet. It will be... Uh, Tom will be very uh, conscious of uh, her, her, that she's missing. And Lord, we pray uh, that uh, you would draw very near, especially now, Lord, that, that uh, the, the visitors will have become less frequent. Uh, Lord, he's, he's perhaps home alone much of the time. And so again, we pray uh, for him and for Lucy, that Lord, they might be conscious of your presence and of your peace, uh, Lord, in these days. We think of those, Lord, uh, who are sick and, uh, Lord, who, whose age uh, has affected their strength and their mobility. And again, we pray for each and every one. We're particularly mindful, Lord, of Angela. And we pray again uh, that, Lord, you would uh, bring healing there, that you would restore her to health and strength, and that, Lord, uh, she might soon be discharged uh, from hospital, hospital, and that she would be able 
uh, to return home. Remember the family here. Again, we pray that you would keep them in uh, perfect peace, uh, that, Lord, they might indeed entrust the situation to you, that they might have confidence in you, uh, even in this matter. Be with us, Lord, here today, we pray. Remember us here as we've met together. Help us, Lord, to worship Indeed, speak to our hearts, encourage us through your word. Uh, Lord, uh, give help even from heaven, we pray, uh, even unto this, your servant, uh, to share with your people today from your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again, this time returning to Redemption Hymnal, if you're using the hymn book, our red hymn book, 117. 117, God moves in mysterious ways. 117, and we'll stand to sing, please. Have your Bibles with you. We're turning back to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. I think it's been about three weeks since uh, we were in the book of Acts. Last week you had the Reverend Eric Stewart, and of course, the week before that was Easter Sunday. And uh, we were thinking about the resurrection. Uh, So it's been at least three Sundays now since we've been looking at the book of Acts. We're going to uh, read from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. And we're going to deal with the whole, uh, all of those verses this morning. 
Verse 12 then of chapter 23. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse, that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he will bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire somewhat more perfectly concerning him. And we are ever he come near are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath somewhat to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took, took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee, that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat, more, somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath, that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night. And provide them beasts, that they may set Paul on, and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter after this manner, Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor Felix, sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews, and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army, and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman." And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their counsel, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee, and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, he said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. And in our reading there, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you again uh, Lord, for this opportunity uh, to be together as your people. Indeed, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to consider your word, uh, to look again at this 
a wonderful book in the Bible. We thank you, Lord, for uh, all that we have been able to consider thus far. Uh, Lord, for the insights given, uh, the understanding given. Uh, Lord, I pray for truth that has been imparted uh, and um, uh, 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 hidden even in the heart. Indeed, Lord, I pray that uh, as we come to this portion of Scripture, that help would be given again from heaven, and that, Lord, you would help me uh, to, to teach as I preach here, that you would help me, Lord, to explain and expound, that you would help me, Lord, uh, to indeed uh, encourage and give hope uh, even to uh, your people today. And this, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning as we continue our study in the book of Acts, uh, I want to look at the providential protection uh, of the Apostle Paul uh, when his life was threatened uh, by a Jewish plot. To put that another way, I want us to look at how the Lord preserved the life of his servant by supernaturally using what we might say the natural to accomplish uh, his will. For divine providence is, is God using our circumstances to accomplish his will in our lives. It's, it's different, of course, from the miraculous where God might, inf- where God invades the natural world where God invades our world uh, to accomplish his purposes, whereas divine providence is God using the natural world, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, to bring about his purposes. In fact, I want you to note that this incident in which the Lord providentially protected Paul's life, it sealed the promise that the Lord had given to him just the night before in the fort of uh, Antonia. Namely, and we read it there in verse 11, that he would uh, bear witness of him, that he would bear witness of Christ in Rome. The Lord had told him, you're going to Rome, Paul, and you're going to bear witness of me there. And what we read about here sealed that promise, showed Paul that no matter what happened to him, no matter what befell him, the Lord was still going to get him to Rome. For that was his purpose, that was his plan for Paul's life. Now, I want to begin this morning by considering, first of all, the plot formulated. The plot formulate it. And there's three things that I want to share with you as we think about the plot that was formulated here. First of all, the conspirators. The morning after the night in which Jesus appeared unto Paul in the fort of Antonia, and we see that in verse 11, and the very day after he had given testimony before the Sanhedrin, And we thought about that about three weeks ago there. Some of the Jews, Jewish zealots, they banded together. They formed a group to kill the Apostle Paul. We're not told exactly who they were. Some have suggested perhaps they were the the Jews from Ephesus or the Jews from Asia uh, and from Ephesus in particular. Uh, others have suggested that perhaps they were the dagger men. They were the assassins uh, that, that killed Romans and people who associated themselves with the Romans. Doesn't really matter, but those are just a, a couple of the suggestions. We have conspirators here. In fact, more than 40 of them bound themselves under a curse that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed the apostle Paul. That is, they had called on God to strike them down dead 
if they failed to keep their oath, if they failed to, to, if they, if they ate or they drank even before they killed, uh, the apostle Paul. And in the book of Samuel there and in Kings, we, we see a, a, a sort of similar refrain where certain people say, God do so to me and more also if I do not do this. They're invoking uh, a curse upon themselves. And that's what these men are doing here. They're trying to show uh, the, the members of the Sanhedrin that they go to how earnest they are, how zealous they are in order to kill Paul. And sadly, these men had a seal for God. But it was not according to knowledge. One can be zealous for God and still be unconverted. You understand that? You realize that? There are many people who are zealous for God, but they've never been born again. They've never been converted. And yet they have a seal for him. And sometimes their seal for God can be greater even than the seal of the true man or woman that has been born again of the Spirit of God. But these men here, they had a seal for God, but not according to knowledge. They had banded together and had brought themselves under a curse in order to kill the Apostle Paul. Secondly, then, consider the co-conspirators. Now, these men, these Jewish zealots, they knew they couldn't do it alone. So they solicited, we're told in verse 14 there, uh, the help of the chief priests and elders. They solicited uh, the help of the the Sadducean members of the Sanhedrin. Now, if you can remember back three weeks ago, um, the Sanhedrin was really consisted of two parties. You had the Sadduceans and you had the Pharisees. The Sadduceans were the liberals. Uh, the Pharisees were the conservatives. The Sadduceans did not believe in the supernatural. The Pharisees did. And the Pharisees were more antagonistic towards the Apostle Paul. And so these 40 plus men, they went to the Sadducean element. They went to these people who really hated Paul. They went to them to solicit their help. They went to them and, uh, and they told them, they, they asked them to confess the other members of the Sanhedrin, that as a whole body, both Sadducean and Pharis the Pharisees, that together, together, they should go to the chief captain, to Claudius Lysias, and that they should pretend, that they should pretend that they wanted to talk to Paul further so that they could kill him. I suppose they, they knew who to approach. That's the way we could put it. Go to the Sadducees, get them on your side, and then get the Sadducees to convince the rest of the Sanhedrin to do this heinous thing, to do this murderous thing. In fact, they told him that they would lie in wait for Paul, so that they could ambush and kill him when he was brought down to them. And so we have two groups here that become one group. We have, we have the conspirators, these 40 Jewish zealots who go to the Sanhedrin, which of course was the highest court in the land, those who were meant to uphold the law, and they go to these, uh, the, to the Sanhedrin here for their help. Now, as for the conspiracy itself, these Jewish zealots, 
uh, asked uh, the Sadducean element, as I said, to convince the rest of the council that they should go to the chief captain so that they might be able to uh, quiz Paul further. They were to pretend, and when he came down, uh, they were going to kill him. So we have the plot formulated. The conspirators, the co-conspirators, and the conspiracy. Secondly, then, the plot find out. The plot find out. Again, three little things here. Just to unpack this passage, we have the relative. The relative. In the providence of God, a nephew of the Apostle Paul overheard the plot and told Paul about it. Now, we're not told how he overheard. There is the thinking here that he might have been there when the plot was originally formulated. It's hard to tell, but in the providence of God, in the providence of God, he heard it. He overheard it. And he went and he told Paul. In fact, he bravely uh, entered the castle, as the King James puts it, the fort of Antonia, where Paul was being held prisoner to tell his uncle about the ambush. The lying in wait there means ambush that the Jews had left, uh, had laid for him. And that's quite a remarkable thing, really, when you think about it. For we're told he was a young man. He was a young man. Uh, Paul is described as a young man himself in Acts chapter 7 and verse 58, uh, when he, he looked after the clothes of of uh, those who killed Stephen. And Eutychus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 9 was also described as a young man. So the, the age group here is quite large. But it seems here to me as I look at it that he was a very young man. In fact, for the chief captain would later, we're told, take him aside by the hand in order to talk with him privately. Now, I've wondered and I've looked into this and I can't really find an answer. Uh, Did it mean like he took his hand like you would your little uh, little child and took him aside? Or did it mean that he took his wrist? Because the wrist was often associated with being part of the hand. It's hard to tell. But either way, he took this young man who had bravely gone to the castle, gone to this fort where there were uh, 1,000 hardened Uh, soldiers to tell Paul about uh, this conspiracy. What's more, it's possible that um, he wasn't even a Christian at the time. For it is believed that when Paul said, I have suffered the loss of all things, In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. That included being disinherited, disowned by his own family when he became a Christian. Now we don't really think about that too much, do we? We we think more about the 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 conversion of the of the of the apostle Paul and how miraculous it was uh, and all these wonderful things that he that the Lord enabled him to do. But becoming a Christian cost Paul in many ways. And it is believed, and it makes sense to me, that when he became a Christian, his family disowned him. His family disinherited him. And there are people like that today. People who, if they trust in Christ or, or, or who have as a result of trusting Christ, they have been disowned. They have been disinherited. And that is part of the cost for them. Not so much in Northern Ireland, of course. But you go across the border. And there are those there who come perhaps from a Catholic background. And when they get saved... There is a good possibility that they have been disowned, disinherited, 
The family doesn't want anything to do with them. And then you go to Muslim countries of the world, uh, and when a a Muslim man or a Muslim woman gets saved again, uh, they are disowned, even into uh, those who practice Hinduism as well. And so the cost for many of these people is greater than the cost that we have to pay. And yet there are many people in Northern Ireland who are not willing to pay the cost, which is a lesser cost in order to be saved. And that could be you. That could be you. You know you need to be saved. You know what it will cost you. But you're not willing to pay the price. And yet Christ offers you what you will never find in the world. Now we can't be sure. It's very possible that he wasn't saved at this time. Certainly if if he overheard the conspiracy. It's possible that he was saved as well at this stage. Uh, I, I would imagine the Apostle Paul being the Apostle Paul. That when he had an opportunity, he he told his family about the Lord Jesus Christ as well. But obviously, uh, his nephew here, he knew that the plot was evil. And he knew the right thing to do was to expose the plot. And we might also say because... Blood is, after all, thicker than water. Now, we're not told what Paul was thinking at this time. But I think we can safely conclude that he was thankful for the warning. For it assured him. It assured him that he would, without fail, bear witness of Christ in Rome. Even as the Lord had told him the night before. Paul, you're going to Rome. And when this came to light, he realized, he realized that, that the Lord had warned him, had shown him, had told him what's going to happen. But don't you worry, Paul. I'm going to get you to Rome. You can trust in me. You can believe in me. You can have confidence in my promise. And so can we. The Lord works providentially in our lives and he will bring about his promises and his purposes in our lives. The relative. Secondly, the request. Now, when Paul heard of the plot, he immediately asked one of the centurions to take his nephew to the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, for he had something to tell him. For Paul believed in the legitimate means to ensure his own safety And amazingly, the centurion did so without any hesitation or questions being asked. So Paul, Paul knew this, that this, that, that these men were ready to kill him, but he used legitimate means to, to seek to foil their attempt to kill him. And we should use every legitimate means at our disposal as well in order to do the work of God, in order uh, to, to even foil our enemies. And I, I think it's quite amazing that this, this centurion, he, he did as Paul had bidden him. He did as Paul had asked him. And it sort of suggests to me that even though Paul had only been in custody, really for a couple of days of even that, that he had an appreciation, a respect for this man. That Paul had already left an impact. And so the question is then, what impact do we leave? Even when we only meet people briefly or for a short time, is it a good testimony, a positive testimony? as it was for Paul here. Anyway, he brought him straight to the chief captain and told him that Paul the prisoner had asked him to personally escort him uh, to him because he had something to share. And let me just add here that um, 
the centurion refers to to Paul as Paul the prisoner. Now, Paul considered himself to be a prisoner, but not the prisoner of man. He considered himself to be the prisoner of Jesus Christ. You read about that in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1 and Philemon uh, chapter 1 and verse 9. He refers to himself as the prisoner of Jesus Christ. And so he understood here that his imprisonment, his captivity, yes, man was part of it, but ultimately he was in prison because that's where God wanted him. And that can be hard for us perhaps to really reconcile. If we find ourselves in that position, what would we think? But for Paul, he considered himself to be the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Then we have the report. When the centurion presented the young man to the chief captain, the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, as I said already, took him by the hand and took him aside so that he could talk with him privately. In fact, he took him by the hand to reassure Paul's nephew that he had nothing to worry about. This young man, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to harm you. I'm not going to hurt you. And then he calmly asked him, what is it that thou hast to tell me? What, what do you have to report to me? And reassured by his calm and caring demeanor, Paul's nephew gave the chief captain a full account of the Jewish plot to kill Paul. Moreover, he pleaded with him, do not yield to their demands to bring Paul down to the Sanhedrin for further questioning. The way he handled that young man helped that young man to to open up. He had gone there, of course, specifically to, to, to uh, reveal the plot, but the way this chief captain handled him um, helped him to do so quite confidently. And of course, how we handle people as well, and sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. But if we handle people right, we'll always get more, pe- more from them than perhaps we might have done otherwise. And anyway, when the chief captain heard the report, when he heard about uh, the conspiracy, uh, he, he let the young man depart and he charged him to tell no one. And so that brings us then to the last portion, the plot foiled. We thought about the plot, plot formulated, the plot found out, and then the plot foiled. Again, three very simple little things. I want you to note the action taken. Now, to foil the conspirator's plot, avoid a potentially explosive confrontation with the Jews, and to see if Paul's life, the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, realized that he had to get Paul out of town. He had to get him out of Jerusalem. And to his superior Governor Felix in Caesarea, ASAP, as soon as possible. And so he quickly called for, his, for two centurions and charged them to make ready a military escort to take Paul to Caesarea. In fact, they were to prepare almost half of his garrison. There were 1,000 troops in Jerusalem. And he asked him to prepare virtually half of them to take Paul to Caesarea. 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 70 spearmen to escort Paul. And that they were to do so under cover of darkness. For they were to leave that night at 9 p.m. The third hour of the night, it was 9 p.m. And incidentally, this would be the third time that Paul had to leave a city under cover of darkness. The first time was in Damascus, Acts chapter 9 and verse 25, where he was lowered down in a basket from the wall 
in order to escape for his life. The second time was in Thessalonica, where again he had to flee at the encouragement of the saints there for his life under cover of darkness. And here he is again, the third time having to escape for his life. Okay, escorted by um, 470 plus men. What's more, they were to arrange uh, beasts, we're told there in verse 24, presumably a horse uh, for Paul to ride on to safety. Now, whilst they made ready, um, the chief captain wrote a letter to Felix, the governor in Caesarea, to explain, explain why he was sending Paul to him. And needless to say, he, he painted himself uh, in the best possible light. We like to do that same, the same thing, don't we? Uh, he painted himself in the best possible light. For he told Felix that he had rescued Paul, whom he understood to be a Roman citizen, from being killed by the Jews who had seized him. Of course, he had said nothing about the fact that he actually thought Paul was the Egyptian that had led uh, an insurrection against Rome in 54 AD. And we thought about that before. And how he had almost scourged Paul. He left those things out in painting himself in a good light. So it wasn't the whole truth. At least in the first part uh, of uh, his letter here. And then he told him that he had followed protocol. For he had brought Paul before the Jewish Sanhedrin to know what he had done to upset the Jews. He told them that uh, the whole issue, it was a Jewish thing. A Jewish thing. It had nothing to do with Roman law. Absolutely nothing at all. In fact, he told Felix that he had done nothing worthy of bonds, of death, sorry, or of bonds or chains. And here we have, in this letter, another of Luke's official statements from Roman officials proving that Christians uh, were not considered criminals uh, by these officials. Now, one of the reasons that, that Acts was written it is thought, is that it was to be like a legal brief or a legal defense even. A legal defense. It was written to a man called Theophilus to give an account of all that Jesus began to say and to do and of how the church uh, came into being and, and how, how it, it expanded across the Roman Empire. But it is also thought that it was to be used as a defense For Paul, when he stood before Caesar. And here we have a letter written by a Roman official saying that he did not find Paul worthy of death or of bonds. And so those then who would have read that, uh, read uh, the book of Acts would have seen on numerous different occasions that the Romans themselves never condemned Paul or any Christian. And then to conclude his letter, he told Felix that he had learned of a Jewish plot to kill Paul, who was, remember, a Roman citizen. And as such then, he decided to send Paul immediately to him to hear his case. And that the Jews were to personally go down to Caesarea to make their case against Paul there. Without an official accusation, Paul was moved providentially one step closer to Rome where he was to bear witness of Christ. You see, no charge had been made for breaking a Roman law. If a charge had been made, he could have been moved. But God providentially enabled him to be moved without a charge. 
Because God's purpose for Paul was to go to Rome at this stage to bear witness of Christ among the Romans. And God works providentially in our lives, as I've said. And that's what I want you to get out of this this morning. There's a lot of history and uh, narrative here. But God works providentially in our lives. He works our circumstances to bring about his purposes. And it may be that we will have to pass through difficult waters, difficult times, as he brings about his purposes in our lives. We were singing there a moment or two ago, uh, some through the water, some through the, blo- uh, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. We will all pass through something that, that will, will try us and test us in the providence of God to bring about his purposes in our lives. Now at 9 p.m., the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, uh, as he had commanded, Paul's military escort took him and brought him to Antipatris, which was a Roman uh, military post of about 40 miles from Jerusalem, where they left him and then returned to Jerusalem. The horsemen remained with him, The 200 soldiers, the 200 spearmen returned back to Jerusalem. Now, why was that? Well, because the country between Jerusalem and Antipatris was dangerous country. We might say bandit country. Because it lent itself to an ambush. And because it was inhabited by the Jews. Whereas the country from Antipatris to Caesarea It was unsuitable for a Jewish ambush because apparently it was open and flat country. There was nowhere to hide. And it was also largely inhabited by Gentiles. And so there would have been those there who wouldn't really have cared about Paul. Whereas in the first half of the journey, the Jews, some of them would have been as antagonistic towards him as those who were wanting to kill him. Anyway, the next day, the horsemen escorted Paul Uh, the rest of the way to Caesarea. And then they officially turned Paul over to Felix. Now I'm sure you're wondering what happened to the 40 plus men who bound themselves with the curse. Their plot had been foiled. What happened to them? Did the Lord strike them down for failing to keep their oath? I doubt it. For the Lord had no part in their murderous scheme. Did they die of starvation? Again, I doubt it. For the rabbis could grant them absolution for failing to keep their oath. And so in all likelihood, they sought to be absolved of their foul and just got on with their lives. Now, isn't that something? You could find something like this. A murderous foul. And still you could go later on if you weren't able to achieve it and be absolved of it. And that seems to be what happened here. That they sought absolution and then got on with their lives. But God had intervened providentially here to foil their attempt to kill him. Very quickly then, the inquiry made. Now, when Felix Felix read the chief captain's letter, he asked Paul where he came from in order to determine whether Paul's case fell within his jurisdiction. And perhaps even he hoped that he might be able to pawn Paul away off to someone else, let it be somebody else's problem not mine. Anyway, when he heard that Paul was from Cilicia, he knew that it was his responsibility responsibility to rule in his case. And so he promised Paul that he would hear his case when his accusers had come down from Jerusalem. And finally, the courtesy shown. In the meantime... 
Paul was commanded to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. That sounds quite ominous, but really he was granted the privilege of staying in the residence of the governor himself. Stay in his home, we might put it that way, to stay in his home. Because his residence was really the palace of Herod the Great. Remember, Herod the Great was the one uh, who had tried to uh, kill all the infants in Bethlehem. Herod the Great had built uh, uh, this palace for himself in Caesarea. But now the Roman governor lived in it, and now Paul was allowed to stay there himself. In the providence of God, God had taken him from Jerusalem, where there were Jewish zealots intent on killing him. He had taken him from Jerusalem, and he had brought him safely in the providence of God down to Caesarea. And in the providence of God, he had given him lodging, but not in a dank, dirty cell, but rather in a palace, in the residence of the governor himself. And so we see here God, the Lord's care for his servant as well, in his providential workings in his life. And sometimes the Lord may do the same for us. Oh, there will be times, no doubt, when we will pass through difficult times, hard times, all in the providence of God for our lives. And then there will be times as well when we will know his blessing, his goodness, uh, his provision, even as Paul needed here. He needed this time, I think, even in... uh, Herod's judgment hall. So there we have it um, this morning. The the plot formulated, the plot found out, and the plot foiled. We're going to turn in our hymn book as we close this morning to 123 in Redemption Hymnal, if you're using the hymn book. Though troubles of seal and dangers of fright, Though friends should all feel and foes all unite, yet one thing secures us whatever betide. The scriptures, the scripture assures us the Lord will provide. Let's stand to sing, please.
our Father in heaven, as we have taken time to unpack and consider uh, this portion of Scripture, Lord, Lord, I and have thought about the providence of God in Paul's life. We pray that, Father, we too uh, might have that confidence that the Lord will uh, work providentially in our lives. Indeed, that we might even be able to look back and trace uh, how he has done so, where he has brought us from and where he is taking us to. Uh, For, Lord, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. And we pray that, Lord, we might indeed uh, rest in that uh, confidently, knowing that, Lord, you will bring about your purposes, even through, uh, Lord, the circumstances of life for each and every one of us. Impress that, Lord, I pray, upon our hearts and our minds today, In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.